Hey everyone, it's your American F1 Journal here. As part of our Drivers of Color series, we had a chance to catch up with the legend himself, Willie T. Ribs. Ribs is an icon inside of the motorsport world, becoming the first African American to test drive a Formula One car, and also becoming the first African American to make it into the Indianapolis 500. We had a chance to talk about a multitude of topics, including diversity and inclusion in motorsports. So sit back and relax and enjoy our conversation with Willie T. Ribs. We've got none other than the legendary Willie T. Ribs with us. And uh, for those who are not familiar with you, you are an icon in the motorsport world. You know, you were the first uh, African-American to test an F1 car. And for those who are not familiar with F1, F1 is the pinnacle of motorsport. It's the highest level that you can achieve. Uh, you, and you were the first African American to test one of those cars. And well, I got to tell you, there's only been, there's only been one African American, not just the first, only one, and two men of color, myself and Lewis Hamilton. Exactly, exactly. And, and there's a lot, and, like, and there's going to be a lot to unpack here. So we we may have to do a two parter because there's a lot to unpack with you. I mean, you're the first African American to make it into the Indianapolis 500. You know, I mean, it's a huge achievement, and we know the history uh, for those who have, uh, you know, before you that have attempted to get into the Atlas 500, a lot of drivers of color reaching back to the 20s and 30s. You know, we can reach back to Charlie Wiggins. We can go back to uh, Dewey Gatson, those who are not able to make it into the Atlas 500 given the time period, given what was going on, huge segrega segregation going on with them. Joey Ray. You know, and you had a moment with Joy Ray, which I'm going to want to talk to you about, too. Um, but first, I just want to know how you're doing, you know, and, and what's been your take on the last six months? Like, I mean, we've seen so much. We've had a, you know, global pandemic going on. Uh, we've seen a rise uh, in protest of, uh, you know, racial inequality and discrimination and police brutality. And this has also reached into the world of motorsport with what we've seen from Lewis Hamilton and Bubba Wallace. Uh, in Formula One and NASCAR. So just, just your take on what's been happening. Well, I mean, the, the whole world is is at a turning point right now. And and in the next 30 years, um, if nothing changes, we'll all be gone. By 2050, mankind will be off the planet, done. Uh, we're just we're going down a road and unless um, unless the the youth, and it's going to take the youth to change everything, uh, we're we're heading for a cliff, and and that's being um, and that's being uh, spurred along by a blonde guy that calls himself president of the United States, and uh, we that it's we're at a powder keg now, and 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 leaders. This guy in, in, in the United States is useless as tits on a board. So, uh, and that's a hog, right? A uh, uh, boar hog, right? So, it's going to take uh, other leaders uh, to uh, counter that, counter uh, an evil message and a hate message, and bring us back together. And I don't know if we were all back together. Now we've got to, just for the sake of survival. And, and how's your family been doing during this time? How have you guys been doing out there in Texas? We know Texas has had an increase in numbers, just like a number of other states, um, as we've had an increase in the coronavirus cases. How's everybody been doing over there? Well, Texas is a huge state. I mean, Texas is equal to three or four average states in, in this country. So we've got a lot of people who are... Uh, we're 36 million. Uh, we're 10 million short of California, and uh, you know they're they're running real high. I, the higher populations uh, or states are, are going to get hit the hardest. You know they've got the most people, and uh, the most cases are, are going to show up. And uh, in my case, you know I'm out in the country, uh, and that's why I live in Texas, so I can be out in the country and. Uh, so it's been, you know, so far so good. It's good. I'm glad you guys are safe out there. I know you're on a ranch. How's ranch? What is ranch life like? Because 
city guy here, so I've never seen much of a ranch. Um, got relatives that hunt in the south, but you know, is ranch life a bit different compared to uh, city life? Oh yeah, I mean it's quiet and uh, a lot of work because you got a, a a lot of uh, real estate to uh, to take care of, and uh, but you know it, it just keeps me busy. You know, of course, my son Theo is one of the top shooters in the world. So, you know, we we shoot a lot. That gun never comes out of our shoulder. So, uh, uh, you know, and Theo's got to do it for his for his profession. You know, that's what he does. So he's got to you know stay sharp and and shoot. He shoots all the time. So, and I'll shoot with him just to uh, you know work on uh, different target presentations and. And and <clears throat> moves to the target and and how we're going to look at look at the target. So you know the ranch is great because you can always go into the town. You can always go in the city and party and you know and have dinner and come back to the ranch. Nice, nice. Now we we know you've got a, a new movie out, new documentary out, Uppity, Willie T. Rib Story. It's on Netflix and Chassis dot com, um, which is. If anybody hasn't seen this yet, they need to see it because it, it really gets into the crux of what's going on. I think it's very relevant to what's going on today in telling your story and your journey into, you know, into motorsport uh, because your, your repertoire, you know, what you've covered, you know, everything from Trans Am, NASCAR, Formula One, IndyCar, you know, it, it's a huge list and a huge list of accomplishments. Um, going into the making of this, you know, what... What were some of the key parts for you? What were some of the most, you know, emotional parts for you in making this uh, documentary? Well, I, when I last saw you uh, at uh, the U.S. Grand Prix in Texas here, I was telling you about the film that it was getting ready to release. Right. And we premiered February 5th. It went Netflix number one for one week. And... The response worldwide has been more than I could have ever imagined. Uh, people who could care less about racing, people who could care less about sports. I got messages from uh, movie stars. Sean Penn, just recently, um, uh, entertainers, uh, athletes, uh, about the story and 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 what uppity <clears throat> meant to them when they when they uh, finished watching it. People are going to look at this title and say uppity. Well, what, what is uppity? Well, I mean, it, it, for one, uh, the, ter- the, the title uppity grabs people by the, by the shoulder. And uh, I picked up, I was given that title when I went to race NASCAR back in the late 70s. And how, what made me think that a black man could come from where I came from, California, and come down and race, uh, and race with them, and not bow and shuffle, and say yes sir, no sir. Okay, uh, I looked at him eyeball to eyeball. They had a problem with that. I talked with them uh, mano a mano. Eyeball to eyeball, they had a problem, and that therefore I uh, was tagged uppity. He's uppity. He's out of his place. He shouldn't. He shouldn't be here. He's not equal to us. And I made it clear right from the outset: you are not entitled to be. Mm. And there's some some you know, having watched it, there's some really really powerful moments in 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 there, and um. One image that stands out for me is a there's a point where you're talking about after you're you've come back from England and you're you know you you've gone through Formula Four which you excelled in, you dominated you you went through and won the championship, but you hit that that point where you couldn't go any further, and you had met Muhammad Ali at that time and you were talking about him and your your grandfather, and there was an image of you sitting in the airport. I believe, and there was a sign under, under above you that said "unclaimed baggage," which I think was like such a powerful image. While you were talking about not giving up, while you were talking about continuing on 
even though you were not racing, you were still going to continue on with this. Why that image? What, where did that, what, at what point in time did that image get taken like that? Because it just lined up perfectly with what you were talking about in that scene. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know what the narrative was for that image uh, other than, you know, I mean, actually, I was coming back. That was in New York. And I just came in from Portugal from testing uh, Bernie Ecclestone's Formula One car. And I guess my brother took it. It was, <laughs> you know, uh, that it oh, all fit into the narrative. Yeah, it fit. It 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 really it really worked. I mean that 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 image with when you were talking about not giving up and continuing on. I mean, it was a really powerful uh, scene that you had. Well, I mean, giving up wasn't even a consideration. Uh, I don't think the industry, you know, the industry of auto racing is is a very arrogant industry. It's arrogant. It's pompous. It's uh, almost a, entitled elitist. That's uh, and maybe that has a lot to do with their upbringing or or background. Well, you know, I could I could I could claim I'm entitled and I'm an elitist. I didn't come from I came from a very well-off family, and so, um, I, I, but they uh, had a difficult time with my uh, not backing down, and there was no question. After a while, they just got used to it. You know, this guy is not going to back up, back down. We can't intimidate him. We don't. We don't scare him, and um, and. They, they got the message. It took a lot, a lot of, a lot of years, a lot of years. Where did this, where did this confidence come from? Because the, the whole thing throughout this, this documentary of yours and with you, like you have this incredible confidence. I mean, it, it's just overwhelming. It's, it is so, it's really inspiring to see that because people often hit, you know, points in their life where they feel like, oh man, I can't do this. I can't make it through. You get frustrated. But here you were, no matter what you faced, and you faced a lot. You continue to still have this this overwhelming confidence. Where did this come from? Well, I, 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 you know, I grew up uh, on a ranch. The man who on the ranch was my grandfather, who was born in 1899. Uh, just for reference, the Titanic sunk in 1912. So he raised me the old-fashioned way. Be very tough. Don't turn another cheek. You must be honest. You don't lie, cheat, or steal. That was his message. And you work like hell. But you don't turn another cheek. You don't back down. And, and you must remain confident at all times. Win, lose, or draw. You must remain confident. And determined. And then with that upbringing, plus my relationship with Muhammad Ali, Ali had pretty much the same message. However, Ali was more, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put it on you. That was Ali. I, I'm not only my confident, I'm going to make you not have any confidence. And that was what I learned from Ali. I think it showed in one one of the part that stuck out to me is when you were talking about your your period in NASCAR and you went to Talladega and you were, you know, you pretty much were describing the scene in Talladega and what it was like and what you were facing. I mean, there were you talked about death threats, you talked about the, you know, the scene of what was happening, the reaction to everyone with you being there, you know, and, and that you said that, you know. I'm going to give him a reason not to like me. Basically, this confidence that you, you kept shining through this confidence despite this, you know, this adversity that you were facing in that time. Well, I went, to, when I uh, walked into the pits of Talladega, I, I felt like, you know, like anyone else. I mean, I was up-and-coming race driver. I, there was drivers I wanted to meet. And uh, the and and shake their hands like david pearson was one of them 
And I hadn't been in the pits a half an hour. And people were walking by me, spitting at my feet. And at first, the first time, one or two times, I just thought, well, they just got a lot of chewing tobacco in their mouth. And then it got to be uh, quite obvious. And that's when uh, they crossed the line with me. And uh, um, I, I, when they crossed the line, I let them know. And I got into the driver's meeting. And I just asked the question, an intelligent question. But I thought, you know, they might, you know, wonder why I asked that question. So they, they thought I was uppity for asking the question. Well, hey, you want to get into my head? Well, I'm going to get into yours. Okay? I'm going to get right back into yours, and I'm going to stay in your head. Well, they couldn't handle it, so I had to leave. I came back. I left, yeah. uh, left the track. And, and during your time at 414, I mean, after you had to leave, you had to, you know, you couldn't get into the Formula 3, you know, did, was there times that you tried to get sponsorship? You were trying to get that backing to try to continue on so you could go to Formula 3? I mean, we have to imagine this is a time with no social media, no internet, no, you know, how we do now where everybody can just get on the internet, promote themselves, boost themselves up. What was what was it like? What was this, the scene like for you trying to get backing and sponsorship back then? It was, especially back then, there was virtually uh, everything was no, no. Despite going to England, and if I could have uh, had a multinational company sponsor me uh, in England, I would have stayed in Formula 3. And there was teams in Formula 3 that wanted me as their driver. They just didn't have the backing to do it. So um, I had to come home. But I definitely wanted to uh, stay there. and. And, you know, Bernie Ecclestone, my, I met Bernie Ecclestone in England. Uh, he came to see me race when I was in Formula Ford. And um, he was always a supporter. And I'll never forget. Uh, I'll never, he's, he's like my uncle. I love him to death. And uh, he, um, uh, he wanted to, he, he wanted me in his Formula One team. This was years later, but mm -hmm. there was, just uh, the, the, the sponsor that he had at the time was Italian. They wanted two Italian drivers, and I, I totally respect that. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's sad because we know that Formula 3 is that stepping stone going into Formula 2, Formula 1, you know, and, and you were there. You were on that stuff. It's incredibly hard, you know, to get into this. And that gets me into to asking you, like, with now, with the state of play now, for American drivers, you know, I mean, to have a path, you know, to get into Formula One, I mean, do you essentially have to uproot yourself and go to England like you did? Or do you feel there can be a path created through a Penske, through a, an Andretti, through, you know, some of the big teams and some of the other sports here in America? In the old days, when Mario was doing it and Dan Gurney was doing it, they, you know, Mario started over here and then went to Formula One, uh, but not now. Um, Formula One is on another planet. It is the NFL of auto racing. And there's IndyCar and NASCAR are not even close. They're in another, uh, they're at the bottom rung of the ladder and Formula One is at the top. It's just, um, you know, I, I, unbelievable. You're not going to see uh, an American driver leave here and go there. It's the other way around. They come from Formula One and they come down to IndyCar in their, you know, later on in their career. Yeah, you met Dan Gurney when you were younger. What was what was that like? We know Dan Gurney is a legend. He's he's a is one of the American. Formula One drivers we've had, he's racing Indy 500. And you had an opportunity of meeting and taking a picture with him when you were young. What, what was that experience like for you? Well, I don't remember what the what the the time I took the picture. I don't remember that because I was real young. But 
later on, I ended up, I raced for him. You know, I, he hired me and um, he hired me because I was fast as hell and I could win. And, um, and when we did, it was, it was, he was the best owner I'd ever raced for. And what, and why he was the best owner is because he was a, a, a legend himself. He was a great race driver. He was a great team owner. Being that he was a former race driver, he understood what a driver was. He, he totally uh, just, you, you were on the same wavelength at all times in terms of what you wanted out of the car, what you wanted professionally, uh, personally, he, he, got, he, he, he understood. And, um, and, and our relationship was, he was somebody like, for example, Roush, Roush and I did not like each other at all, but it was business. He built a uh, great horsepower. His, uh, his crew built, built a great chassis and I could win. But we never had dinner, not one time, not one time. And do you think? Uh, do you think it's a, it's important? How very important to have that that symbiotic relationship, you know, with with a team owner, with a, a team principal, mechanics. Like, is is that that sort of synergy really important to to being successful? You got to have it. You got to have it. And, and if you look at the relationship that Lewis had with Nikki Lauda, for example, for uh, uh, Nikki died. Uh, you look, look at the relationship he's got with uh, T. Wolf, right? Um, it's, you've got to have that. Not to mention your engineers, your technical staff, you, you, your family. And, and if there's any glitch, there's any glitch of any of the members of the family, that's just, that's not good. That's not good for performance. It's not good for overall morale. It's just it, you all have to be on one page with each other, and you're a family. Yeah. Um, there was another point in the um, in the documentary that that stood out to me, and that was the uh, of course, obviously, when you made it into the Indianapolis 500, and that whole journey. And you spoke about the moment that you, you, uh, you know, Joey Ray came into your pit, and, and Joey Ray is a is an icon in the history of of African American men who uh, were in motorsport, uh, and that got really emotional for you. You know, I mean, what was it like to have Joey Ray there in the pit with you in that moment? Well, it was. I mean, it was more than just symbolic. It was. I knew Joey Ray could identify with me and I could, and, and I could definitely identify with him. Joey Ray actually should have been the first African American. And he was qualified to do it and he was fast enough to do it. He was a, a really uh, awesome race driver, right? Who could have been in the right car, been the first African American, but he was prevented okay he was prevented from racing at indy and uh you know indycar has got a very checkered past to this day to this day because if you look at indycar now there's no african-american drivers in indycar there's no there's no black driver in indycar there is in formula one would you believe NASCAR has got a, a African American driver and IndyCar doesn't? Yeah, we have Bubba, Bubba Wallace in uh, NASCAR. Yeah, so Lewis Hamilton in Formula One. Uh, yeah. I think George Mack was after you. I think a few years after you that race. Yeah, there was two black drivers in in the history of the Indy <clears throat> of the Indy Five Hundred. Two, <clears throat> myself and George. And that's and and why do you think why do you think that is why do you think it's 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 still difficult for uh, for African Americans to get into motorsport? I mean, oh, 
That, that's the easy, easy answer. It's the easiest answer on the planet. The sport does not want African Americans in their sport. Okay, they don't want it. They want women. There's been nine women Indy 500 drivers <clears throat> and two African Americans. Well, and we know recently. I, I'm not sure if you had a chance to watch last weekend's uh, um, Austrian Grand Prix and Formula One. We saw um, a lot of the drivers kneeling. You know, there was a big promotion for uh, Formula One's mm -hmm. new initiatives, you know, to, for inclusion and uh, in promoting diversity in the sport. We know Lewis Hamilton has been very vocal um, in promoting diversity. He's always has, but he's, he's been even more vocal in this. Um, what are your thoughts on last weekend and, and, and what Formula One is, is planning to roll out? Well, former <clears throat> Lewis Hamilton, for one, <clears throat> has taken the lead. He's taken the lead, and, and he's um, he's shown the sports world how important it is to take the lead, not just racing, but the sports world. Of course, Cal, Cal, Colin Kaepernick, he was the 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 the, the founder. He was the leader of mm. <clears throat> fighting social injustice and taking a stand against uh, racial injustice. Right. So what Lewis has done, and, and now all the drivers have followed his lead, has um, set a standard, okay? He's, all right, guys, I'm going to lead this charge despite all the pushback, despite all the negative comments, mm -hmm. despite all the... the um, vile response that he's gotten from uh, men, men, you know, you know, people that don't, uh, that really, those people who push back on Lewis, they support uh, uh, racism. All those who, who push back on him, they support racism. They support uh, what's happened in the past, and they don't want to change it. They want it to stay status quo. Well, Lewis, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of Mercedes for supporting him, okay? Um, I'm wearing black right now because of Mercedes, right? Their support. The Germans are just the best, and, uh, and I'll stand by everything they do. Um, the other drivers, the drivers who kneel, they 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 are all part of. We're going to change the world. What, yeah. what, how small it is, we're going to try to change it. It, right. it might not be very much. Even the ones who did kneel, they yeah. still had the shirt on. Right. In racism, so. They're, they're, they're sending a message, and, and, and the youth group are, 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 are seeing it and applauding it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a powerful image last, last weekend. It really was. And, and, and Formula One wants to, to push this, you know, this initiative you know, of uh, inclusion and diversity. They want to put a task force together. You know, and, and, and if you had a chance to be on that task force, you know, what would you what would you say? What would you suggest? Because they're, they're looking for outside influence as well and those who can help with this diversity if inclusion. If there's anybody on the task force that would know how to handle it, anybody could be Willie T. Rose, period. Because nobody, not Lewis, not Bubba Wallace, none of not has, has dealt with what I dealt with for so long, right? I know the business side of racing. I know what it takes to uh, develop uh, a diversity program. I know what it takes. Ron Dennis has got the playbook. Okay, right. just took Lewis and made him uh, and made him a champion. Right. And now he's a global superstar. And Bernie Ecclestone. And believe me, if Bernie Ecclestone didn't want Lewis in Formula One, he wouldn't be there. Right. 
Hamilton saw Lewis Hamilton as a as as a potential to open up bigger markets for Formula One, mm. and he's done it. And yeah, he's done it. they saw it, and and it was a business decision. Yeah, not, not based on race, right? Based on business. Yeah, and and that's and and they want to and, and Formula One wants to create business here in the states. They want to expand, you know, their visibility. You know, obviously, let's talk about a, a second race. But now that we're getting into the initiatives they want to roll out, I mean, it kind of rolls into one a little bit of, you know, inclusion, diversity, and increasing visibility. How do we go about taking those steps to get that visibility and yeah. that inclusion in the, in the United it, States? It really, it's really not rocket science. It's really easy that the, the auto, uh, auto racing industry mandate, not ask, we're not going to ask you. We're not going to beg and plead you. Every automobile manufacturer on the planet, because everybody drives a car, all colors, all gender, race, everybody drives a car. Each and every auto manufacturer puts up over a million dollars and puts it in one pool for driver development, diversity, and and mechanical and engineering, right? And start uh, and 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 create a farm team with that mm-hmm. money for yeah. these kids to go up the ladder from go karts right into for the good for the ones who are qualified and good enough right into any car or Formula One. It's really easy to do, and 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 for them to waltz around like they're dumb and they don't know what the hell to do is bull. Okay. Have, they, have, they, have they contacted you yet, Willie? Have no. they? No. I'm too tough a guy for them. I'm way too tough. They can't, they can't uh, slow walk me. They can't bamboozle me, right? They can't. And they know it. That's why they, well, let's get this. It, it, I'm Django, okay? I'm Django, okay? In the movie Unchained, right? Right. They want they want a Stevie. That's what they want. They want Stevie. Okay? They're not going to get that with me. They're deathly afraid that I know too much and I'm going to uh I'm going to hold them to the fire and say, "All right, this is what needs to be done. Do it. Get it get it handled." And you got and if they didn't have the money to do it or the resources to do it, or the intelligence to do it, it'd be different. They do. They have the intelligence to do it. They have the resources to do it. They don't want to do it. So is there is there is there much do you have hope that that something that, you know, the task force or that Formula One will start pushing this harder in in you know in, in, in this new initiative that they're coming out with? My wife always tells me hope is not a strategy so i don't i'm not hoping anything i'm i'm saying this is what needs to be done uh uh, get off your flat turd cutter and get it handled Mm. and i'm old school like that i was raised old school that's how my grandfather talked to me he was born in 1899 i haven't changed my language okay (laughs) There, this is what needs to be done. Do it, and 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 don't throw food stamps at it. Don't throw crumbs at it, and say, "Oh, we're we're doing something." No, you're not. You're not doing something. What <clears throat> what they are in effect saying? <clears throat> it's like a man. It's like a man who walks into a bar and sits down starts talking to the woman next to him and he starts talking about his manhood. She finds out later that it was really his short hood. Okay. Okay, that's what the industry has been doing. Right. And that's what they've announced. You announced your manhood, but it's really your short hood. So do it right. And 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 I don't care whether they like what I say or how I say it, because I'm telling them the truth. Okay, you know, like 
this medicine, we're not drinking wine or whiskey here. Or right? <clears throat> right. We're drinking, we're 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 drinking straight alcohol. Yeah. That's what they need. No wine, no beer, straight alcohol. You know, we I was talking about this uh recently with uh Bill Lester, who uh who talked highly of you. Because he spoke about uh, his journey through motorsport as an African American in motorsport and his encounter with you and uh, speaking with you and, and, and talking to you. And it was very, you know, it was very willy how you approached him. Do you remember when you met uh, Bill Lester? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there was, I, there was a Trans Am ride that I helped him get with a team, Paul Genalosi, a long time ago. Uh, it might have been 1988. Yeah, I've known Lester forever. Yeah, very, very awesome guy. Very uh, Uncle Bill now, I believe I call him. So, <laughs> and um, I don't, I don't know, Willie. It's, like I said, there's so much to unpack here. Um, I want to remind everybody though that they can see Uppity on uh, Netflix, on Chassis.com. Uh, definitely, they should. I highly recommend it. Everybody watch this documentary and this journey that you've taken. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot in this subject of trying to find a, a means of African Americans, especially young African Americans, making it into motorsport. Because, like you said, it's the deck is almost stacked against them at times. You know, I mean, your father raced, and he and you know, essentially, you said that's inspired you into racing. How do we inspire the next generation? Of well, they're going to have to see success. Okay, first of all, you got to inspire yourself. No one can inspire you, but you got, no matter who you are, you have to see that it's a, obtainable. You got to see that it can be, uh, it can be, it can be done. I, because I grew up in the sport and I understood it and I knew what direction to go, that made it easier for me to, to uh, start my career start down that path i knew which path to go <clears throat> but uh, a lot of kids nowadays they have to see that wow you know in stick and ball sports it's quite simple you know you a bat and a ball and you go out and you play and you develop your skills and it doesn't really cost a lot and you see you see the better system Kids see when well, you do good and you go to college and you do good, and then maybe you become a professional. But it's there. Well, uh, these kids have to see the same thing. And I'm sure a lot of them see it through Lewis. You know, a lot of drivers uh, in the past saw it from my, you know, from me. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you've got to have the support no matter what your de desires are. Now I was lucky. I had white men who backed me, who didn't give a damn about what the industry thought of me. Mm -hmm. Jim Truman was one. Paul Newman was another. Dan Gurney was another. There was a lot. Uh, you know, and then there was, of course, Bill Cosby. If it wasn't for Bill, I wouldn't have been in any 500. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's is there's a lot of there's a lot of people that that supported you in that time during your 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 you know your achievement into the Indy 500, and and I've oftentimes talked to young people, you know, young people of color, and they've never you know never seen Formula One, never seen Lewis Hamilton, don't know of Lewis Hamilton, and it's 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 very interesting because you see images of just you know white men on TV. It's, it's a white sport. So it makes a lot of young people of color feel like, oh, well, that's not for me, you know, because I don't see anyone who looks like me in the sport. You know, is there, what were your thoughts, what would be your thoughts on trying to find a way to get people to know, like young people of color to know this, to, to understand there is a place for them in motorsport? I, <clears throat> continued success of, uh, uh, of African Americans in the sport not just from the driver's side, but from the engineering side, mechanical side, um, that they've got to be exposed to it. And, 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 and when I was racing, 
a lot of times the the media, uh, uh, you know, especially the the, the racing media um, and, and TV in particular would not show me, even though I was out in front leading the race, they'd show the other cars. Yeah, that was all by design. Huh. All by design. Uh, uh, in, in, in a lot of cases, uh, some of the races I won have been buried. Buried. So, you know, it, it's, that's all to demoralize. That's all to to uh, sweep away. Let's, let's, like it didn't happen. Well, Uppity just showed the whole world that it did happen, and this is how it happened, and we're going to continue to uh, push it and ram it down your throat if you don't like it. This, you're not going to turn away from reality. And, and you're not, there's, there's millions of people who want to know this. White people, too. Lots and lots. They want to see, wow, he did this. How did he do it? And why didn't we know about it? Right. And, and I think it goes into what's, what we're seeing right now, because we, we see that there's a global, you know, it's such a broad stand against the, you know, against uh, racial inequality, against discrimination. You know, we have white, black, everyone is involved this time. Everyone's all in. That's, and that's the greatest thing for, for mankind. Because it's not going to be one group that's going to change the world. It's going to be everybody that changes the world, period. That's the only way it's going to happen. Or we're gone. The dinosaurs are going to outlast us. They will have outlasted human beings. Because if it doesn't change, whether it's environmental or social, we're, we're, we're history. We want to thank Willie T. Ribs for joining us here on The Rundown. And be sure to check out Uppity, the Willie T. Ribs story on Netflix and Chassis.com. So until then, my friends, I'll see you when the lights go out.